Unit credit. We've been looking at the American economy. And joining us now, most timely, the liberal that conservatives love to hate, Jeff Sachs, joins us from Columbia University. All sorts of uh, thoughts here on where this nation is. And I'm going to go back a number of years to his book, The Price of Civilization. Chapter 5 was A Nation Divided, and that's what we see. Bring up the quote here. This is from early in the book. That is politically impossible. Consensus is beyond reach. Jeff Sachs has heard that time and time again. The social responsibility of the rich, roughly the top 1% of American households, have never had it so good. And yet, Jeff Sachs, you didn't see this 2017 moment coming, did you? Well, this uh, war of the rich on the poor is really astounding. And uh, on top of a huge budget deficit, unprecedented inequality in America, largest uh, wealth the soaring uh, at the top. Uh, they want more and more and more. If you were sitting with Republican senators today that are on the fence on what will happen with the Senate and the House, Collins, McCain, Flake, and the others, Mr. Corker of Tennessee, what would you advise them about the longer-term picture versus immediate political needs of their Republican Party? Patriots should oppose this period. I Why? would say because our budget deficit is already huge and rising, and this is pure populism, an unusual kind of populism, populism by the super rich, but it's pure populism. We cannot afford tax cuts. The idea that somehow has gotten into our heads in recent weeks that, oh, 1.5 trillion, right. that we can give away is unbelievable in any serious country. Unfortunately, we are not seriously governed right now. Uh, governance is uh, flaky in this country. And how you start out with the idea we can make a gift of one and a half trillion to the super rich for the heck of it is really shocking. I, I've never seen anything like this in, in uh, uh, being part of and watching a policy in this country for uh, three and right. a half decades. But, Professor, isn't this what, you know, uh, Donald Trump campaigned on? And isn't this part of the reason why he got elected? Who the heck knows? But what difference does it make? Why should we run our country into the ground? Why should we be destroying uh, fiscal balance? Why should we be heading to 100% of gross domestic product in debt? And as the Congressional Budget Office has shown, heading to 150% of GDP in debt on our current policies over the next few decades. What does it have to do with right. anything uh, to have this horrible kind of policy. Yeah, th this but then is... why have elections? Why have elections if, if, you know, if, if we think that this was one of the policies, whether you agree with it or not, and if this is what the people voted for... We didn't, should, we didn't vote, we didn't we vote on it? this. The public doesn't even want this. Look at the opinion surveys. We voted for two candidates. We don't vote on a package of tax measures. We didn't vote right. on the Obamacare repeal. Get over it. This is not about okay. the election. This is about horrible policies and why are we aiming to ruin the United States of America this way? Why are okay. the rich so greedy that they don't care about Jeff, fiscal policy anymore? I saw you at every Columbia football game this year. I want Harm Bondles <laughs> wants to get in here. But sure. here's the Columbia football powerhouse. You're in a course right now and there's that kid out there, uh, Michael Murphy of Tampa, playing for Columbia football and he's an econ major. Is this fiscal policy and legislation in any of the textbooks that you studied? Can these kids in economics today see normal economics in this tax debate? Well, you would find it in the chapter on Juan Perón, Hugo Chavez, uh, and other populists. How do you link Chavez to the upper 1% in America? Because they both ran completely irresponsible fiscal policies. They both went to budget deficits right. that are completely unaffordable. They both would run, they would run this country into the ground the same way that Chavez right. ran Harm? Venezuela into the ground. And Harm knows this in Germany. Would Germany ever pursue a policy like this, Harm, Harm? ever? No, I mean, you know, to that question, I mean, I'm finding myself sometimes being accused to be on the very left side here. Where, whereas well, we it, know that at Bloomberg well, Surveillance. <laughs> whereas in Germany, I mean, I was studying economics and I was part of the conservative side. So you know, it was a very similar view on the economy and how the world is, is, is working. I'm put in a totally different political corner. But let me just answer. But would, would Schauble ever go no. with a policy like this, ever? 
Never. But Nobody would of seriousness. This is populism, but populism of the rich. Can I answer to, to, to um, Francine's point? Isn't that what, what Trump has been elected on? I mean, I some sympathy for your answer that who knows why. But I think really he's running on Make America Great Again. They talk about 3 or 4% uh, GDP growth and additional uh, uh, 25 million jobs. I mean, we have been questioning that. But really the point is he wants, I mean, that is my understanding, the, the core of the campaign, put accelerate growth, make a better job market. And I completely agree with Jeff that this is not the right politics to do so. I th I'm still a supply sider, if you want, but I think it should come through better productivity growth and there are better ways to doing it and we start with education. All right, uh, Jeff, who in the Trump administration can actually push back against what the President Trump is trying to do, right? And, and is there a revolt in the Republican Party? And if not, why not? Look, the, the Republican Party has been funded by David and Charles Koch, by Robert Mercer, okay, by Sheldon okay. Adelson. Yeah, right. Jeff, I'm going to cut in. This is critical. You are correct, Jeff. You're correct. They've been funded by them. What they've been funded by is he won in Wisconsin. He won in Michigan. How does he win in Wisconsin and win in Michigan with this tax cut? The effect of this tax cut on the people of Wisconsin and Michigan will be is devastating. extraordinary. Of course it it's will. It's bizarre. Of Look, everything's bizarre. They ran on, uh, they have run on legislation that is absolutely opposed by their own constituents. You go to any opinion survey, the public wants more taxes on corporations. It wants more taxes on the rich. What you get is the opposite because our politics is so corrupt right now. Everybody knows it. Not enough people say it. Our politics, and so I'm going to say it again, our politics is broken and corrupt. It's because billionaires fund the Republican Party, and the congressmen even say it. If you read the newspapers right. day by day, they say we have to deliver for our donors. Our donors will desert us unless we deliver. They don't okay. say we have to deliver for the American people. They say we have to deliver for our donors. So let's right. wake up and be grown-ups about what's going on right now. But Terrible Jeff, policy, I'm, I'm a, a gift to the relieved. rich, against the interests of the American people, for the right. interests of a few billionaires who are pushing mm. this process. And we but have Jeff, to say no, because I don't want this country wrecked. All right, but I'm a little bit removed to it because I'm in London, but I keep on reading that President Trump still has his base supporting he him. He has so his base. 36% is, is his base. 36% and 59% are against this guy. So he's got a base, okay. but he does not Jeff, have a governing majority. What, what is the response of the Democratic Party? Clearly, you support the Democratic Party. Do the East Coast, West Coast progressives have to give it up and get a new kind of Democratic Party candidate to provide a pushback to what you're talking about? Do you seek a new Democratic Party? Absolutely. And, you know, maybe uh, if the whole system had not been rigged last year, Bernie Sanders would have won the nomination. We know how much it was rigged inside. Could he have gotten elected across this nation? Compared to Trump? Absolutely. Uh, okay. We're going to come back with this spirited conversation. Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University and the liberal economist from uh, Germany, Harm Bondels, joins us, of course, <laughs> chief U.S. economist for Unicredit. On Bloomberg Daybreak on radio, the same kind of fiery conversation about the moment that we have for this nation. Karen Moscow, Robert Moon, Bloomberg Daybreak, Coast to Coast, Sirius XM Channel 119. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Taylor Riggs. Let's get the Bloomberg Business Flash. It's an upbeat presentation from Volkswagen today. The German automaker raised its revenue and profit targets for 2019. Plus, VW plans to meet its target of a 30% dividend payout ratio within five years. The company is trying to bounce back after spending billions to resolve the faked emissions test scandal. Music streaming service Spotify has decided to list its shares on the New York Stock Exchange. That's according to a Swedish newspaper. The report says NASDAQ had offered Spotify listing in New York with a secondary listing in Stockholm. 
And it's taken nine years, two presidential elections, and multiple lawsuits and protests. But today, TransCanada learns if it will get the final state permit needed to build the Keystone Oil Pipeline. Regulators in Nebraska will make a final decision on whether building the pipeline is in the state's interest. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom, Francine. Taylor, thanks so much. Herm Bondel's with us for the unit credit and also Jeffrey Sachs with us of Columbia University. Let's combine their abilities on Europe. And Mr. Sachs, the late 80s, the early 90s, you were out front in a review and advising Russian capitalism. Whatever anybody can say about Europe and Brexit, Europe, the United Kingdom, there's always the view to the East. Whether it's John Keegan, World War I, there's always that view to Russia. How does Mr. Putin fit in in 2018 with the pressures of Europe? What will be the newness of Russia and Europe in the coming months? Well, look, all the hopes of uh, the uh, early 1990s uh, have been lost, unfortunately, because uh, in that period, Gorbachev, who was president, had a, a vision that we would make a zone of peace and prosperity. Instead, we have war in Ukraine, we have Russia meddling in our elections and meddling all mm -hmm. through Europe, uh, absolutely uh, stirring the muck. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, <clears throat> we're in, a, in hostility, right. and uh, we don't know what happened in our country, of course, right. on this. Arm bundles just off the King Charles Bridge in Prague is the Unicredit offices. I've seen the little mm -hmm. plaque. It's a very historic uh, building. It was there at least uh, six, seven, eight uh, years ago. What does Unicredit see for Eastern Europe this year is a timeless buffer between Europe and Russia? Yeah, despite the increased political tension in some countries not going in the right direction, um, I think particularly the, the European Union members in Eastern and Central Europe are, should be doing pretty well. I mean, they benefit, we, we see what's going on in, in, in Germany, Italy, France. Growth is back, growth is strong, and of course that is helping these countries um, as well. So these positive growth spillovers are, are the main driver for certainly 2018, so we are pretty optimistic on that. Um, Arm, are, are we underestimating political risk in Europe? I'm thinking of the Italian elections, and it, that kind of circles back to what we were saying about Germany. Yeah, it's tough to say no after what happened last night in Germany, because who would have expected that? I mean, the signs have been, had been growing that, that the agreement um, towards the Jamaica coalition has gotten tougher and tougher, but we all thought that just a normal bargaining stance, and at the, at the end of the day, they can agree on something. But, but as I said earlier, I think Germany will still be um, having a, a stable government with pretty predictable policy outcomes. Um, Italy has an election. Um, we, we think um, that, that it will be... There won't be many, many major additional reforms, but we have seen a couple of good reforms in Italy, so it's more stability going on. But if you compare it to last year, where particularly the French election was the big elephant in the room, and we had really no idea if maybe Mrs. Le Pen will, will, will win it, um, compared to that uncertainty, I think Europe looks pretty stable this year. Um, Jeff Sachs, when you look at Brexit and uh, the possible you know, underlying populism that we see in Brexit, is populism in the United States different to populism in the EU? There is actually a lot of similarity. Uh, they're both based on uh, pretty strong uh, ethnic uh, divisions, uh, on uh, anti-immigrant uh, sentiment, which is a, was a very strong part of Brexit, a very strong part of uh, Trump's uh, support is uh, anti the rest of the world. We see this in Eastern Europe right now. Even places that hardly have any refugees are uh, becoming more and more right wing, uh, vulgar, uh, like the march of uh, basically the skinheads and uh, neo Nazis in uh, Poland uh, last week. Really shocking uh, what's happening. There is a general nastiness of politics, uh, and in the U.S. and Europe, uh, we're uh, sharing that nastiness. Are we so distant then from Atlantic Charter to GATT to multilateral efforts? We have a bilateral president, uh, Ross Navarro, is, is clearly a bilateral and anti-China document. We have a zero-sum neo-mercantilist president. Is that where we're back to, is 1920s? Blockism, B-L-O-C, blockism? We, we don't have uh, any memory in this country, and uh, Trump uh, is, uh, is, is a throwback uh, and uh, horrible. I mean, uh, this is it, what your writings have been about. Our collective memory yes, evaporates. We don't have it, and we're in a very dangerous world right now with an unstable, psychologically unstable president.
Now, I can't say enough about Jeff Sachs, the price of unit credit. We've been looking at the American economy. And joining us now, most timely, the liberal that conservatives love to hate, Jeff Sachs joins us from Columbia University. All sorts of uh, thoughts here on where this nation is. And I'm going to go back a number of years to his book, The Price of Civilization. Chapter 5 was a nation divided, and that's what we see. Bring up the quote here. This is from early in the book. That is politically impossible. Consensus is beyond reach. Jeff Sachs has heard that time and time again. The social responsibility of the rich, roughly the top 1% of American households, have never had it so good. And yet, Jeff Sachs, you didn't see this 2017 moment coming, did you? Well, this uh, war of the rich on the poor is really astounding. And uh, on top of a huge budget deficit, unprecedented inequality in America, largest uh, wealth the soaring uh, at the top. Uh, they want more and more and more. If you were sitting with Republican senators today that are on the fence on what will happen with the Senate and the House, Collins, McCain, Flake, and the others, Mr. Corker of Tennessee, what would you advise them? Should we run our country into the ground? Why should we be destroying uh, fiscal balance? Why should we be heading to 100 percent of gross domestic product in debt? And as the Congressional Budget Office has shown, heading to 150 percent of GDP in debt on our current policies over the next few decades, what does it have to do with right. anything uh, to have this horrible kind of policy? Yeah, th this but then why have elections? Why have elections if, if, you know, if, if we think that this was one of the policies, whether you agree with it or not, and if this is what the people voted for? We didn't, should, we didn't vote, we didn't we vote on it? this. The public doesn't even want this. Look at the opinion surveys. We voted for two candidates. We don't vote on a package of tax measures. We didn't vote right. on the Obamacare repeal. Get over it. This is not about okay. the election. This is about horrible policies and why are we aiming to ruin the United States of America this way? Why are okay. the rich so greedy that they don't care about Jeff, fiscal policy anymore? I saw you at every Columbia football game this year. I want Harm Bondles <laughs> wants to get in here. But sure. here's the Columbia football powerhouse. You're in a course right now and there's that kid out there, uh, Michael Murphy of Tampa, playing for Columbia football and he's an econ major. Is this fiscal policy and legislation in any of the textbooks that you studied? Can these kids in economics today see normal economics in this tax debate? Well, you would find it in the chapter on Juan Perón, Hugo Chavez, uh, and other populists. How do you link Chavez to the upper 1% in America? Because they both ran completely irresponsible fiscal policies. They both went to budget deficits right. that are completely unaffordable. They both would run, they would run this country into the ground the same way that Chavez ran Harm? Venezuela into the ground. And Harm knows this in Germany. Would Germany ever pursue a policy like this, Harm, Harm? ever? No, I mean, you know, to that question, I mean, I'm finding myself sometimes being accused to be on the very left side here. Where, whereas well, we it, know that at Bloomberg Surveillance. <laughs> whereas in Germany, I mean, I was studying economics and I was part of the conservative side. So you know, it was a very similar view on the economy and how the world is, is, is working. I'm put in a totally different political corner. But let me just answer. But would, would Schauble ever go no. with a policy like this ever? Never. But Nobody would of seriousness. This is populism, but populism of the rich. About the longer term picture versus immediate political needs of their Republican Party. Patriots should oppose this period. I Why? would say because our budget deficit is already huge and rising, and this is pure populism, an unusual kind of populism, populism by the super rich. But it's pure populism. We cannot afford tax cuts. The idea that somehow has gotten into our heads in recent weeks that, oh, 1.5 trillion, right. that we can give away is unbelievable in any serious country. Unfortunately, we are not seriously governed right now. Uh, governance is uh, flaky in this country. And how you start out with the idea we can make a gift of one and a half trillion to the super rich for the heck of it, is really shocking. I, I've never seen anything like this in, in uh, uh, being part of and watching a policy in this country for uh, three and right. a half decades.
But, Professor, isn't this what, you know, uh, Donald Trump campaigned on? And isn't this part of the reason why he got elected? <laughs> Who the heck knows? But what difference does it make? Why should... Can I answer to, to, to um, Francine's point? Isn't that what, what Trump has been elected on? I mean, I have some sympathy for your answer that who knows why. But I think really he's running on Make America Great Again. They talk about 3 or 4% uh, GDP growth and additional uh, uh, 25 million jobs. I mean, we have been questioning that. But really the point is he wants... I mean, that is my understanding, the, the core of the campaign, put... Accelerate growth, make a better job market, and I completely agree with Jeff that this is not the right politics to do so. I th I'm still a supply sider, if you want, but I think it should come through better productivity growth, and there are better ways to doing it, and we start with education. All right, uh, Jeff, who in the Trump administration can actually push back against what the President Trump is trying to do, right? And, and is there a revolt in the Republican Party? And if not, why not? Look, the, the Republican Party has been funded by David and Charles Koch, by Robert Mercer, okay. by Sheldon okay. Adelson. Yeah, right. Jeff, I'm going to cut it. This is critical. You are correct, Jeff. You're correct. They've been funded by them. What they've been funded by is he won in Wisconsin. He won in Michigan. How does he win in Wisconsin and win in Michigan with this tax cut?